Alright, y'all turn to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. <clears throat> Revelation 3, 7. Before we start, let's go to the Lord in prayer. A merciful Father in heaven, we come to you today through the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit you've given us. And Lord, we ask you to please receive praise and worship from us to give strength and glory to all that your Son did, that we might magnify Him and praise Him and worship Him. Lord, in this uh, uncertain conditions today, the way man is just so nervous and thrown all about, we thank you for the comfort and for the hope and the stability you've given us in Christ. Lord, we pray, if anything else, that at least someone will come to the Lord through all of this chaos. We know that you'll keep us and you'll protect us. Father, we pray that maybe this would be the start of revival in the church, that your name would be magnified in our country again and throughout the world. But whatever it is, we know your will be done. And we just pray you that you would be with us and guide us to keep our minds on Christ Jesus and not on the things of this world, to not be swayed and moved about, to be steady in the gospel and in the truth that is in our Savior. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right. Before we get going up, uh, I don't, I'm not sunburned, I'm almost over poison ivy, so I looked like the elephant man earlier in the week, but, and I thank everybody that uh, told me that they had been praying for me and asking and checking on me, I thank you, I, I really appreciate it. Alright, we're going to pick up our study again today with the sixth church, and I don't know of anything that would be uh, more pertinent to today than this church, let's just read it first. In Revelation 3, 7 it says, to the angel or the messenger of the church in Philadelphia, right? Now, this is not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Philadelphia, the ancient city over <coughs> Asia. It says, These things saith he, uh, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. No man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and to worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. To him that overcometh I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, let's just go back and let's begin considering this one. We're going to take our time with it. But first off, Philadelphia. All right, everybody <coughs> probably knows what Philadelphia means, don't we? Uh, I Who said it? I love. Brotherly, love. Brotherly, love. Brotherly love. That's what it means. Oh, that's right. Brotherly love. Now we're going to see that this church, this Philadelphia church, I'm going to call it the faithful church. Or we also could call it, I, I know there was an old timer that called it the church in opportunity because of the open door. But let's first talk about this city, Philadelphia. Now, the city was founded in 189 BC by a king named Eumenes of uh, Pergamos. And he named it after his love for his younger brother. In other words, he built this city and he said, I'm going to call it brotherly love because he loved his younger brother. And that's how it got its name. But it was destroyed by an earthquake in 17 AD and they had to rebuild it. It was not like the other cities in these letters. All these other cities in these letters were wealthy cities. They were commerce. They were, Philadelphia never rose to that. Philadelphia was smaller and it never was a place that had... Uh, you know, it wasn't known for any one thing like the other cities each had something they were known for. This was kind of a lowly city. But this is a city he started. Now again, it was destroyed by the earthquake in 17 AD and it was rebuilt. And it was rebuilt, of course, with Roman funds. And that's one of the way Rome got control of a lot of these different cities and solidified their position was um, 
you know, today, uh, I'm trying to think, okay, why do we have federal guidelines in our schools today? Did the Constitution say anything about federal schooling? No. no. But the federal government wants to instill certain things, so what do they do? They grant them money. And once they start getting the money, then what do they say? They they, it, they, it's in their budget, they got them, and they say, oh, by the way, you need to start teaching this, this, and this. Well, we don't want to, or we'll cut off your funds. And that's how all that happens. Well, it's also how this place got to be this way. And I say that because under the Roman emperors, especially under Nero and those that came after, namely Trajan, but they literally wanted to rid the world, and the world they meant the Roman Empire, of Christianity. You know, we've all read about the throwing Christians to the lions and all that. He, literally, they wanted to cleanse their, their world of, of Christianity. And that's going to come into this letter. But let, let's just go on, let's start looking at the terms here. First off, he says in verse 7, To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These, say, these things saith he that is holy, now right away, this word holy. You know, we have got two words really that have gotten uh, uh, twisted in our language. Holy and saints. Because of the Roman church, what we have when we hear holy is we think someone that's without sin, don't we? And when we hear saint, we think an extra special person above the others. Ain't that what they teach? And yet the Bible tells us that neither of those are true. The word holy and the word saint come from the same root word. It means set apart, set aside for the purposes of God, appointed. For instance, there is a day that God appointed. It says He had a holy day that He sanctified a day, didn't He? The Sabbath day. Well, how could you call it a sinless day? You couldn't. How about He had a tent called the tabernacle and it was called a holy tent? It wasn't sinless. In other words, that tent and the vessels in that tent were all called holy because they were set aside for the worship of the Lord. You didn't use the tabernacle as a honky-tonk, did they? So that's why this word holy, it means set apart for God. Now right away, we get the picture of division. And literally, this is what the Scripture is all about from beginning to end. The very first prophecy in the Bible came after Adam fell. When Adam fell, what had then entered into mankind? Sin. But also the establishment of a new kingdom, hadn't it? Was man any longer a child of God? Now he's a child of another kingdom, isn't he? And so all men are born into this world. I'll just put it here. The kingdom of this world. Well, what does holy indicate? Set apart. Set apart from what? This world. Taken out of this position and put into another position, right? Now that's holy. Taken out of the kingdom of this world and put into the kingdom of God. And that's why, you know, and I'm not, I'm not mocking you, it's easy to do, but that's why we should never separate justification and sanctification. Now what I mean by that is there are those that teach that justification is when you're saved. And then at some point later, you can enter into <coughs> sanctification. He, uh, you know, people say things like that. Well, he, I need to go in for sanctification. No. Sanctification means set apart. Well, when did that begin? You got saved. It be when you got saved, you've already been set apart. The sanctifying's already started, hadn't it? Literally, when were you sanctified? Before the foundation of the world. The day come when God began carrying it into, into effect, right? So justification is nothing but one of the first steps in sanctification. Sanctification is the ongoing setting aside for the purposes of God. So you're taken out of this kingdom, put into this kingdom. But are you fully ready to serve? No. no. You're a babe, and so what do you have to be? Sanctified, cleansed, built up, trained, don't you? What's one of the methods God uses for doing this? It's all by grace through faith, isn't it? But what does He do with faith? He tests it. He, te he, he tests faith and puts it through a trial. Not only to cleanse it of unworthy <clears throat> attributes, but to build it up, isn't it? And in Philadelphia, this is the thing that's been going on. Now, I want to just show you what this word holy indicates when it's talking about Christ. Go to John uh, chapter 1. Okay. <clears throat> Start.
starting way back here. For instance, when God told Adam that the seed of the woman, well, seed of the woman, literally, this is referring to the person of Christ. He's going to be the seed of the woman. But also, all believers are of the seed. In other words, there is a woman that has children. That's the church of God. And it goes all the way back here. But then there's also a different seed, isn't there? The seed of the devil. Or the children of this world. Now when he said, I'm going to bring the seed into the world, he told the devil, your seed, the people of this world, will bruise his heel. In other words, the world gets after believers, don't they? For instance, what did Cain do Abel? He killed him. And yet that's only the bruising of Abel's heel. You say, don't sound like it. It sounds worse than that. Where's Abel at today? He's with the Lord. Then did Cain overcome him? He just took that life which was going to be taken anyway, didn't he? But he said, but the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the seed of the serpent. <laughs> so in other words, he told us right back there in the beginning, there's a battle. Two kingdoms are now at battle. And which kingdom is going to win? Christ's kingdom. And right back here he tells us this and he puts this in. But he tells us also about the seed, this coming seed. Notice he says in John 1, um, <clears throat> he says, uh, verse 20, uh, verse 19, this is the record of John, John the Baptist. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? Remember, they come out wanting to know, Who are you? Why are you doing this? He confessed and denied, but not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, what did that mean to these Jews? I'm not the Savior. I'm not the Redeemer. I'm not the Holy One. I'm not the appointed one. That's what Christ means. The one God had appointed. When did men start looking for this appointed one? Back in the garden, the seed of the woman. So down through the years, who are the, all the believers looking for? The Redeemer. But what began to happen in the mind of them? They began to misunderstand what they needed to be redeemed from, didn't they? What did Adam know he needed to be redeemed from? Sin. Yeah. Folks, he had lived in, in God's will and now he's out of it. What do y'all think he wanted more than anything in the world? Well, you know, if I could just turn back the clock. Hadn't we all had that? Well, if I could go back in time. We think that way, don't we? So then he understood he needed a redeemer from sin. But when Jesus Christ comes and preaches to the Jews that he's there to make them free, what did they say? We don't need to be made free. As far as freedom was to them, was just political. They said, well, I mean, if you want to whip Pilate, we'll take his throne, but we don't need to be free. And yet Christ was there to set them free from sin. He is the appointed one who before the foundation of the world created all things, and then all things fell under the dominion of the devil, and the creator of all things came down and began to redeem those that were his, didn't he? So that's what the Holy One means. Now again, notice what he says in... Uh, 21, they asked him, what then, since you're not the Christ? Art thou Elias? Elijah? See, they're looking for Elijah because that's what Malachi said before the Redeemer comes, Elijah would come, wouldn't he? And it says, he said unto them, I am not. Now, when he says, I am not Elijah, he's not literally Elijah, is he? But what did Christ say he was? He is the one that came in the spirit and power of Elijah. He is the promised forerunner, isn't he? But what were the Jews looking for? Literal, physical Elijah. Wasn't it always their problem? They never saw the spiritual, did they? Do you know what the Jews are still doing today? Looking for Elijah. When they celebrate their Passover today, they put an empty plate on the table and put food on it and put a glass there for Elijah. This is what they're looking for. There are people looking for him now. Yeah, we got people, bunches of people we know right now. because of false teaching, they're also looking for Elijah to be raised from the dead. Most of them think Elijah and Enoch or Elijah and Moses. And they're looking for them to be raised from the dead and to do something on CNN in the Middle East. <laughs> Folks, dispensationalism is following the same mistake that the Jews. They're looking at everything physically, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. Jesus said, John the Baptist already came. He is the forerunner. But they said, if you're not Elijah, he saith, I'm not. They said, art thou that prophet? Not a prophet, that prophet. Now what do they mean by this? 
Moses had prophesied. He said, the Lord's going to raise up a prophet, a prophet, not many, one, like unto me. He said, but this one's going to be different. This one you better hear, because whoever don't hear this prophet's in eternal doom. And who is that prophet? Christ. Right. Peter teaches us Christ is that prophet. So they say, are you that prophet? You see how they were looking for the anointed prophet. They were looking for the anointed priest and they were looking for the anointed king, weren't they? Did they understand any of these things spiritually? Mm -hmm. But was Jesus Christ that anointed one, that holy one? Yes, yes that's what His name means. Um, go over to uh, John 6. All right, John 6, 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Remember all those people that claimed to believe Him and were following Him when He started teaching His doctrine left, didn't they? They liked the miracles, but they didn't like the teaching, so they quit following Him. In verse 68, Simon Peter answered Him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Isn't that a wonderful statement? You know, if you heard the Gospel and you think, well, I think I'm done with this, where are you going to go? Where are you going to go? I mean, think about it. how is a Christian going to say, I'm not going to be a Christian anymore? If you can say that, you never were a Christian to begin with. He says, where will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. See, that's what this Holy One means. It means that Christ is not holy in that He's free from sin, although He was, He's saying in Christ to the church in Philadelphia, He says, I'm the one. I'm the appointed one. Okay, the Holy One. Now, go over to, uh, back over there, He said, holy and true. And flip back over to Revelation, we'll read it again. Revelation 3, 7. Unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy. He that is the anointed one. These things saith the Christ. He that is true. Now this word true is very important here. There's two different words. This word implies more than just the opposite of false. You know, there's that which is true and there's that which is false. But this word here means something a little different. Uh, this word true is used like this. It means the substance. In other words, the reality as compared to the shadow. Or the, the fulfillment as compared to the type. Um, I'll show you some ways it was said. Do you remember when Jesus Christ said, I am that true bread which came down from heaven? What was He referring to the other side? Manna. manna. The manna came down from heaven, but that was physical bread. And what was it? It was a picture or a type of Christ coming, right? That manna came down and gave them life. <coughs> the wilderness, didn't it? But Christ came down and gave us eternal life if we believe on Him. We also read in the book of Hebrews that there was a true tabernacle which God pitched and not men. Well, what does that make Moses' tabernacle then? A type. A shadow. In other words, that pictured something else. It pictured the, the abode of Christ and the work of Christ. So it's true like that. It's the real substance. So in this letter what he says is, These things saith the anointed, appointed Messiah, the fulfillment of all the Old Testament types. He could have said, These things saith the true seed of the woman. These things saith what all the prophecies have been pointing to, I'm Him. And He's the one talking to the church in Philadelphia. Now he says here, um, <clears throat> by the way, there's, you know, let's go look at one verse. Go over to 1 Thessalonians because this I need to make sure we include this. He's talking about the works of the Thessalonians and how people everywhere had heard about them. Now watch what he says in verse 9. For they, the works they're doing, all the things they're doing by faith, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. So the true God, what's on the other side? The idols, the false God. So this is what Jesus Christ is saying. Look, it's the same thing He said when He said, I am the truth. Right? I am the truth. 
He didn't mean I'm the only one that's ever spoken any truth. He meant I am the embodiment of all truth. I'm the fulfillment of everything that was promised. Okay, so let's go back over and uh, read a little more. Revelation 3, 7. you watching too if I cough I don't have coronavirus <laughs> um, I've had a sinus infection it's getting better now but um he, we went to Lowe's the other day I had to get something and I coughed in Lowe's and Lexi has a fit don't be coughing in here everybody thinks you're smallpox Bob she told me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <we're not. laughs> hey, if y'all don't know that was a guy that the federal government sent out amongst the Indians it was a carrier of smallpox mm -hmm but didn't show the symptoms, and they sent him out with blankets to give to the... That's what sure did. The government did. It is. They did that. That's it. Now he says, To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David. Now what in the world this key of David? He that shutteth, openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. Now you know, in each one of these letters, we have Old Testament references, don't we? Right. And you find out that the Old Testament reference is really kind of the key to understanding the message to the church, isn't it? Here we had Jezebel and we had Balaam and whatnot. Well, this key of David really does set this letter in order if we understand and look at what the key of David is. All right, I tell you, to do this, let's go look. Um, Ted, he makes one other statement on the way. Go to Revelation 1, 18. Along with the key of David, We've also got the same thing described this way. Verse 18, the Lord says, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now what does that mean? He has the keys to him. What does that indicate? The He's got the power to unlock or to lock. He took it from Satan. He took it from Satan. That's right. That's part of the victory he won. Okay. So then, who's the only one that can set someone free from the gates of hell? Christ. Who's the only one that can let someone into the kingdom of God? Christ. So then, who's this all dependent upon? That holy and just one, the Christ, right? In other words, the whole house is dependent upon the one that built the house, aren't we? Now, that's the picture. But let's go check out Isaiah 22. Let's just go back here and read this, and let's... Probably spend the rest of this class looking at this because this is the key to, to this part of this uh, revelation. All right, in Isaiah 22, to set the, the tone, Israel is, is gotten so bad they're going into apostasy and, and going to carry it off into Assyria, captives, and Judah's following right on their heels, aren't they? And the Lord says of Judah and Ezekiel, He said, You're worse than Israel. He said, you saw what Israel did and what happened to them and now you're following in the same footsteps? You know that do it once, shame on you. Do it twice, shame on me, right? Yeah. So then Judah had the example set before him of what idolatry would do. What did idolatry cost Israel? Everything. Everything. And what's Judah doing? Same. They're doing the same thing, only they're doing it worse because they had more light, didn't they? How did they have more light? They had the experience of what had happened before. They had the experience. They could see it. They had history. They had the prophecy fulfilled. God said, this is what I'll do, and they saw it done, right? On top of that, they had the temple, the true religion. They had all these prophets coming to them. They had the Word of God. They had the kingdom. In other words, they should have known better, shouldn't they? Well, in the middle of that time, we've got this. This is during the reign of Hezekiah. Now, y'all remember Hezekiah is a king. If you don't remember, he starts out, I mean, he's, he's a good king, but something happens to Hezekiah, doesn't he? Yeah, Hezekiah, yeah, at one point he did, but you know, Hezekiah, the, the, there's some men, to show you how far they had fallen, they find a book in the temple. Remember this? Yeah. The priests find this book, and they look and they say, now what is this book? What book do y'all think it was? It was the Word of God. It was the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? But they find this book. Can you see how far they've fallen? They didn't even know. You see, that's the priesthood, right? Y'all look at those people that call themselves priests today. Anytime I get around one, if I get a chance, I quote the Word of God. And I tell you what it shows me. They can't. They can't quote Scripture to you. I mean, they might know a little Latin and some of it, but they can't quote Scripture to you. Why? 
that's a book they've set aside long ago. Yeah. Okay, so then you come up, you come up with this idea. They go in the priest go in there. They find this book and they read it. Now in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses said, "If you serve God, here's all the blessings that'll come." And they're there, aren't they? And Israel had received many of them. He said, "But there's the blessing. Well, what's there always with the blessing? Cursing. If you don't serve God, what'll happen?" And there's a whole list of cursings, and it's like they looked at it and said, holy cow, that's what just happened. He also said, I'll make you the head, not the tail. Mm -hmm. And you alone, not, you know, won't be, you won't have to borrow it. You can loan it, but yeah. that's just the opposite over there. It's just the opposite now. Yeah. And so basically what you get in the book of Deuteronomy is you get prophecy. Here is the outcome of following God and walking in His commands. No, it means sinless. It means with a desire to Look, can't y'all all say sitting here today you've got a desire to walk in the commandments of yeah. God? Yeah. Folks, I don't want to walk contrary to God. I'm ashamed when I do. Yet I, I do, I fail. But i got a desire to, right? How about a person that has no desire to walk according to God's commands and yet they say they're saved? John said not so. Hard to believe. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying we don't fail and temptation doesn't get us, but isn't your desire to be pleasing to God? Yeah, you know... It's the first step in that is realizing that all His commandments are good, aren't they? They're all good for us. When we don't and we do the opposite, what's the outcome? <clears throat> Misery and sickness and <clears throat> depression and everything else. It? Okay, now, in this case, they find this book and they read where all these blessings are going to come and all these curses. And this just happened to Israel. They run to Hezekiah with this book, and you remember Hezekiah has them read the book, and when Hezekiah got done, Hezekiah ripped his clothes. You remember what he did? Hezekiah said, we have turned from God. Oh, this is what our country needs today. We have turned from God as a country. Even the professing unbeliever today, it, it, he's, it's... it's in the old days, the professing unbeliever at least would, would give the believer uh, leeway and support, wouldn't they? Not today. No. Now, when Hezekiah tore his clothes, he said, this is it, and he started something. And the greatest revival in the Old Testament started right there in Israel, didn't it? And how did it start? One man did what? Saw something in the Scripture. How did the Protestant Reformation start? One man saw something in the Scriptures. This is how God works. But God started a revival. And Hezekiah started cleaning house. I mean, he got rid of the, temp the false <coughs> temples, the gods, and he was pleasing to God, wasn't he? But y'all know there was a man that was serving in his cabinet. Literally was his prime minister. You know, that's what a prime minister is. They serve under the king, right? So we're going to read about this man. And this man's name was Sheba. But well, watch what Isaiah says, verse 15. Let's read 14. It was revealed in my ears by the Lord of hosts, Surely this iniquity shall not be purged from you till you die, saith the Lord God of hosts. Talking about Judah, he says, Thus saith the Lord God of hosts, Go, get thee unto this treasurer. Now this word treasurer literally means the head of the household. This is the guy that's got control of all the king's possessions, right? He's the prime minister. He's running the show. Do y'all remember... Um, I remember when Joseph was in Egypt. Joseph rose up to be the second most powerful man in the country, didn't he? What did he have control of? Everybody. Everything that belonged to the king. If you wanted food, who would you get it from? Who made all the policy? Joseph. Daniel rose to a similar position, didn't he? This man then, in Hezekiah's, uh, I'm going to call it lost, unconverted state, this man is his right-hand man. You, know, you can tell a lot by, by a person by the company they keep, they say, right? You can tell a lot about a, a, a political uh, candidate by the, the running mate he chooses, can't you? Yeah. And what I mean by that is generally they're going to pick someone and the first thing it always tells me is, well, where's this person they pick from? Because that's a state they're worried about winning. So you pick somebody from, to try and give you some sway, right? Well, this man picked Shebna. Now, we're going to enter into a little, some things here that Jewish history says, but... During this time when Isaiah was prophesying that we better turn back to God or we're going into captivity, were there false prophets? Yeah. You all know what the false prophets were saying? Peace and safety. Yeah. Oh. Down with this man. Matter of fact, the Jews say Manasseh killed Isaiah because of his prophecies. Cut him asunder. 
And somebody was cut asunder because Hebrews says they were. But anyway, <clears throat> with this man Shebna, when did that party that preached peace and safety, when did they say the safety would be in? Trusting God? No. Trust in Egypt. Yeah. Remember, we're going to make an alliance with Egypt or we're going to make an alliance with Syria. In other words, we'll work this out, won't we? And so you had people doing that. And undoubtedly, Shebna was of this opinion. Hezekiah gets saved, though, and guess what? Shebna's got to go. Now, folks, this is, a, this is one of the things conversion will do, won't it? It don't mean overnight, but over time, what happens? Folks, yeah. you, you start to get cut free of some of this stuff, don't you? Now, he says in verse 15, Go unto this treasurer, even unto Shebna. Notice he said, this treasurer. He didn't say go unto the treasurer, go unto this treasurer. See, the, the Jewish history says that this man wasn't even a Jew, that he was an Egyptian from, from a place called Sochni. So this man, in other words, what business has he got even being in this position? None. It says, which is over the house and said, what hast thou here? Now this is very telling if we just let it say what it says. What are you doing in this position? Why are you in this position? What right have you got? Number one, you're not a Jew. Number two, how'd you get this? Well, the Jews said he, he got it through flattery. He worked himself into this position. He, look, this man was like a tick dug in in the government of Israel. Here he is, and he's running show and setting policy. And he says, <clears throat> What hast thou here? And whom hast thou here? See, that indicates no kinfolk. Hey, what are you doing in this position? And who, how is it? Who, who's got you? You don't belong here. He says, that thou hast hewed thee out a sepulcher here? Again, the Jews said that he literally did this, that he built a sepulcher for himself among the kings and high priests. Y'all see what we've got here is we've got a man that's self-appointed, don't we? And guess what his name means? His name means self-rested, self-positioned, self-appointed. Now, how many people do you know that say, I decided to become a Christian? We hear that all the time. Folks, you don't decide to become a Christian. Who, who makes Christians? Christ, Jesus Christ. Christ. In fact, most people I know, if they would be honest, would say, I tried everything I could not to become a Christian. And he wouldn't allow it. He kept chasing me till finally he had me cornered. But if this man, Sheba, had appointed himself, hadn't he? Now, y'all remember in the church, I'll just draw the church over here. In the church of God, and look, the elect or the church of God is no different over here than it was back here. Who are the elect of God back here? Israel. All Israel? No. Well, who was with the elect? The, the remnants, the elect, but right, in, they're in a bigger group, aren't they? So then back here you had Israel. I'll just write it. Israel. And you had what we could call true Israel, didn't you? Yeah. And yet who did you have with them the whole time? Yes. False Israel. Yeah. And together they form this nation, this body of people, don't they? Well, you come over here, what do you have? Yeah. You've got the true church. <clears throat> Church, the body of Christ. And at the same time, what do you have? You've got the false. And together they form one body of people out there, don't they? You know, the world will tell you today that there are two billion Christians in the world. you believe that? No way. There are two billion people that say they're Christians. But do you know what lots of them are? Self-appointed Christians. They join the church. Look, you can't join the body of Christ. Christ makes a Christian. Only Christ can put you in that position, okay? So now, Shebna represents someone that's, that's running the affairs of this thing that has no business doing it. Does that sound familiar? I mean, who took the affairs of this world back here? The devil. Shebna is a type of that. Shebna is a type of the God of this world running the affairs of the house, handing out the goods at his... You know, blessing whom he wants, cursing whom he wants. Shebna is a type also of the false believer, the professor. Now, Shebna here it says, hewed him out a sepulcher. He that heweth him out a sepulcher on high and that graveth a habitation for himself in a rock. 
Do you see the figurative language here? He's, he's digging in on the rock. But who's the rock? Christ. Christ. Is He really in Christ? No. no. Now it says, Behold, the Lord will carry thee away with a mighty captivity and will surely cover thee. He says to Shebna, you're going into captivity. Now this is prophecy, but it, it points to something far more than just the replacement of a man in a political position. Verse 18, He will surely violently turn and toss thee like a ball into a large country. He said the Lord is about to kick you out like kicking a ball. If I kick the ball out of that door, the door's narrow, but it gets out there into a big old wide open expanse, doesn't it? He said, I'm going to kick you out like that. There shalt thou die, and there the chariots of thy glory shall be the shame of thy Lord's house. Again, the Jewish history on this man says that he had his own personal bodyguard, chariots and all that sort of thing. What shouldn't surprise us. I will drive thee from thy station, and from thy state shall he pull thee down. It shall come to pass in that day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, and will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. Now this man Eliakim, let me get his name here real quick. Eliakim means God sets up. God establishes. So look at these two characters back here. We'll come up here first. We're going to write Eliakim. And Eliakim means God established. In other words, who picked Eliakim for this job? God. But then what did Shebna mean? Shebna meant self-appointed. Now y'all consider this in light of the letter to the church at Philadelphia. He said, I'm going to take them of the synagogue of Satan, those that say they are Jews and are not. Now, do you think he literally meant just Jewish people? Yeah. You know, who were the first people to persecute? Right after the cross, the church, even before the cross, but especially after the cross, who were the first group of people that the church was persecuted by? The Jews, the unbelieving Jews. Oh, yeah. And what was their claim? We're God's chosen people. And so they wanted to kill them, didn't they? Well, you come after that and the persecution changes, but the term Jew really doesn't. Jew indicates God's people, chosen of God. Now, Shebna was in a position where he looked like he was chosen, wasn't he? But he was self-appointed. You come on this side. When Jesus preached to the Jews, he said, I've got a message here that can set you free. And what did they say? We don't need to be set free. We're, God, we're Abraham's seed. You see, that's what the same thing that goes on in the church. You talk to people today about the gospel, and what will nearly every person you talk to say? I believe that. I, anyone tell me? I've been a member at such and such for, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I was talking to a lady several years ago, and I, I, I saw her again the other day, and it reminded me of I started talking to her about the Lord, and she said, Oh, honey, you're preaching to the choir. And I said, well, that's great. You know, how, tell me, how'd you get in this choir? Mm -hmm. And she started telling me about the church, the new roof on the church, the expansion, paving the parking lot. See, people believe that, don't they? What's that got to do with anything? Yeah. Folks, no doubt she probably had all kind of things going on, but was any of it of the Lord? Mm -hmm. So the church in Philadelphia is under the same condition. There you've got those true. And what was the distinction between them? They had been tried, they had been tested, and they had been proven true. And so what did he say? I don't worry about these which say they are Jews and are not. I'm going to make them come and bow before you and know that I have loved you, not them. They're going to acknowledge them, aren't they? You know, it's fascinating in the story, when Shema is kicked out, God doesn't run him totally out of town. You know what he makes him? A secretary, a scribe. Imagine going from prime minister to secretary, and who's he got to serve under? The man that replaced him. Yeah, let me give you all a modern equivalent of that. Who was the greatest persecutor of the church right here? Paul. And then Paul gets saved, didn't he? And what did he have to do? He had to eat crow before Peter and all of them, didn't he? All the Jews. How about Paul goes out and starts preaching, and in one synagogue in Corinth, the leader of the synagogue's name is Sosthenes. 
Sosthenes wants to beat him up and kill him and drags him in the court. Remember that? Yeah. And then what happens? Sosthenes gets beat up. God took care of it. And later on, Sosthenes gets saved. And who's he serving under? Paul. Paul writes a letter and says, Me and Sosthenes. You see, there is a time when every knee is going to bow, isn't it? Every tongue shall confess. So then we'll just move on with this idea here. But watch what happens. In verse 21, he's going to take Eliakim, and I will clothe him. Notice he's not going to clothe himself. Now what is he clothing Eliakim with this robe a picture of? The righteousness of Christ. You are chosen by Christ, set apart, and put a special uniform on you. A special name, a seal. You've taken out of this kingdom and put into the kingdom of God. And you can't come into this kingdom in your old clothes, can you? You've got to come into this kingdom. You go from being stripped naked into this kingdom clothed. Now he says, verse uh, 21, I will clothe him with thy robe, strengthen him with thy girdle, and I will commit thy government into his hand. He shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, and the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. You see, that's what the Lord was quoting to the church of Philadelphia, wasn't He? Mm -hmm. So then when you read that letter, what do you do? Well, let's go see why did He quote that. What was the context? And in the context, what is it? I'm going to give you the authority of the house. I'm going to put you in the house, and I'm going to have one over this house that's not going to be like Shebna, self-appointed. I'll give you an example. Can you all think of a self-appointed Christ today? Pope's the first one that comes to mind, isn't he? There's many more, but the Pope literally will tell you he is Christ on earth. Mm -hmm. That's what he says, isn't he? He's the vicar. He says that. Yeah. Well, the day's coming when that man's going to acknowledge before everybody he know Christ. Yeah. Matter of fact, he's not even knows nothing of his house. He's going to be cast out, isn't he? What's he going to have to do over here? Jesus. Bow down and kneel and admit Christ as the Lord just before he's cast into the lake of fire, isn't he? Who's going to be present at that time? Christ and His bride will never be parted again, will we? He doesn't say that to Philadelphia, I'm going to make them come worship you. He said, I'm going to make them worship before you in your presence. Okay, so now, this man, uh, Shedna, is, is kicked out, made to be a lesser servant. And he said, I'm going to give you the key of the house of David. Notice I'm going to lay it upon your shoulder. you will flip over to Isaiah 9. Now, who is Eliakim here a type of? The type of Christ. Alright, Eliakim, which means God sets up. He said the government's going to be on his shoulder. Now, look at verse 6. Isaiah 9 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, there in peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon the king, uh, his kingdom, to order and establish it with judgment, with justice from henceforth, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now who's that talking about? Christ. Christ. Did God commit all things to Christ? Yes. So just like Shebna, a type of the God of this world, was put out, wasn't he? But he's not gone forever. He's still right there in the presence in, in lesser power, isn't he? What did Christ do with the devil at the cross? He gained victory over him, and yet where's the devil still at today? He's still ruling in this world, isn't he? But he's ruling in under the authority of one that's greater than him. People today go too far with this idea of the God of this world. The term the God of this world does not imply omnipotence. It implies who does the church worship? Christ. Who does this world worship? The devil. He's the God of this world. They don't even know it, do they? Now, can the devil do anything today that God doesn't allow? No, no folk can't. Not one bit. Greater is he that's in you if you're saved than he that's in the world. So back again to the church of Philadelphia. 
What he's indicating here is that, like Eliakim was over the house of David. Who's now over the house of David? Christ. Right. And where's Christ seated at today? Right hand of the Father. Right hand of the Father. Now, what about this, this position? Um, <clears throat> go to Hebrews 3. What did the head of a house do? You know, there's a term over and over in the parables we read about a householder and we read about a steward, don't we? It's, it's the governor of a house. It's the head of the house. It literally, look, this is what the word dispensation in our Bible means. It means stewardship. It doesn't mean an age or a period of time. That's not the meaning. Look it up. It doesn't mean that at all. It's the same word translated stewardship. All right? When Joseph rose up to power in Egypt, who was really in power? Pharaoh. But who did he commit all power to? Joseph. Joseph. You remember what Jesus Christ said after the cross over here? Before he went up? <coughs> right here, before he goes up, he told them, all power is given unto me. All power. Now, we, we knew a teaching that said, well, all power was given unto him, but he's not using it yet. Folks, be, beware of that stuff. Where do you get that idea from? They say, well, look at this world. Everybody's not saved. Was it ever his intention to save everybody? No. Okay, so now, he went up and said, all power is given unto me. And from that position, what is he doing? Hebrews 3.1 Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, not an earthly calling, heavenly, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He says, who was faithful to him that appointed him. There's our word holy. Appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Moses and his house were a type of Christ. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Now Moses is a stone in the house, isn't he? But what is Christ? He's the builder and the head of the house. He says, verse 4, for every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. He said, Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. In other words, it was tes testifying in a type to something that was going to come. Christ, verse 6. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, and that's what the believers in Philadelphia had done. They had not denied his name and remained firm under, under tribulation, hadn't they? So then what's he telling the people in, in, in the letter, basically? He's telling them to consider the story of Shebna and Eliakim. When the time came, did God purge out the, the unbeliever? Yes. He purged him out, and did he put his man in position? When due time came, did God send Christ? Did Christ come and do everything God said? Yes. Was all power committed unto Him? And He ascended up, and from that position up there, what's He acting as? He's the head of the house. Now watch how He does this. Go over to uh, John 1. Alright, in John 1, we read this, verse uh, 15. John bare witness of him, Christ, and said, saying, This was he of whom I speak. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace, or grace upon grace. Now, where do we receive all grace from? Right. From Christ. Where did the people in Jerusalem receive all their uh, supply from? from? Through the prime minister. In other words, when Shebna was in control, he ran things, didn't he? But you know, it says when he put Eliakim in, he said Eliakim will be a true father and he'll look out for the poor, won't he? Shebna obviously didn't do that. Does any politician do that? No. But Eliakim, a type of Christ. Hey, let's, let's go back and read. Well, let, let's read one more verse. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What do you mean you get all good gifts from? 
from Christ. Flip over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 7. Alright, in Ephesians 4, 7 we read, But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, who determines how grace is handed out? Christ. Christ. And does all, do all people get all things the same? No. We all get the same salvation, don't we? Amen. But it all comes grace in different uh, installments. Amen. Okay? I mean, you know, look, we're all different, aren't Amen. we? And therefore, you can't judge another person's salvation because they don't possess the same gifts as you. They don't, you know, it's not like that. It'd be like saying to a child that can't walk, well, you're not really a son. You can't walk yet. I can run a marathon. You can't walk. No, he's just immature, isn't he? So we go on. He says, this is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore, we, he, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. How did he lead captivity captive? Where were we all captive? To this kingdom and this devil. What did he do? He led us into freedom. Then what did He do? He ascended up and gave gifts unto men. Now y'all think how Christ did this. How did He get the authority to take this house? He paid for it at the cross. Folks, the Son of God came down into this mess. I mean, y'all look at the world today. Have you ever seen a bigger mess than today? He literally, you know, people think that we're advancing? Really? <laughs> I mean, isn't that insane? The world system we got right now, we're so close to our country just absolutely collapsing and just starving to death. The only thing we got we can trust is the Lord. Our knees. Yeah. We ought to all be on our knees look, thanking right. Him for every breath we right. get home. Right. But you know, it seems like it's only in hard times that that happens. I pray people do that. We ain't doing it now though. No, we're not. Not yet because the food ain't run out. <laughs> but and look, I'm not saying it's going to. I don't know. That's one thing I'm certain of. I don't know. But I know this. David said as a child of God, I was young and now I'm old. And all that time I've never seen God's righteous children begging bread. Yeah. God takes care of us, doesn't He? he you look to God. Don't look to the government. Look to God. Now, in this particular instance, the church in Philadelphia has is, is got a very similar situation going on. They're there living in the midst of persecution and they've passed through much of it and they're still faithful. And what did he tell them? Your faith's proven out. Your faith is tested true and therefore I'm going to pour out upon you more grace. I'm going to open a door. I'm going to give you some advantages and some responsibilities and some privileges that you've not had previously. Now y'all look at all the great revivals that have ever taken place. You know how they all started? One man who had been tested and tried and proven true. Before the Protestant Reformation ever started, what had Martin Luther already done? He already took a stand on the Word of God. I mean, they tried to kill him and he said, y'all going to have to kill me. Look, this is the truth. I can't say anything else. I can't do any other. So he proved out, didn't he? See, God never, God never tows a cart with an untested rope. I'll put it that way. You know, when I was in the Navy, Mr. Howe, you remember they do those load tests? Yeah. They take a rope. Hey, I don't know if y'all have ever seen one, but a rope on a carrier is about that big around, isn't it, Mr. O? Yeah. And in the Navy, they show you films that it's dangerous. Them ships are so heavy and that rope stretches. And when that rope stretches and does that, it sometimes it can pop. And when it ever breaks, they'll show you videos that'll cut a man in half. Remember all that, Mr. O? They set up dummies, and when that rope snaps, it coils back like a snake. It's dangerous, isn't it? So what do they do with those ropes before they ever tr uh, trust them? They test them. Yeah. Well, what does God do? Yeah. He tests us. It's not that God tests us that we might know anything. It's that He's got to put an edge on the blade before He uses it, doesn't He? So we go along with this idea here. He's going to pour out these gifts. He said again, He gave gifts unto men, verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is, but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth. I used to think that that meant going down below, below you know, the surface, but I believe this has more to do with his leaving up here and coming down into this world. It says this, He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles. Who gave the apostles? Christ. Christ. Who picked them? Christ. Christ. What did he pick them for? 
for the good of his church, the building of the church. He said, apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That word perfecting there, that's what happens with our faith. It's being perfected. He says, till or until we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect or a mature man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, in Hebrews we're told that we can come to the throne of grace boldly, can't we? So then when Christ went up, what did He say He would do? He said, I ascend up. But then what did He say He would do next? The return. I will pour out My Spirit. Didn't He? Who's been, who's been the power running the church since the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit. Where do we get all our gifts through? Holy the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Where did every revival that ever happened happen through? The Holy Spirit. I mean, y'all read them. They all start in some little group somewhere, tested and put through it, and all of a sudden revival starts, doesn't it? Yeah, I, I pray all the time that this is... I've got several people that I talk to all the time, and it's kind of like the Lord's putting the same thing on everybody's heart at the same time. That, I mean, hey, people talking about they're going to start praying and fasting and asking God. Well, that's a good thing. Yeah. You know, so there are people that tell you you're nuts if you fast, but fasting has to do with seriousness. Mm -hmm. Remember what the Lord said? They said, how come your disciples don't fast? He said, well, why would they fast while the bridegroom's with them? Well, what does that indicate? You fast when He goes away. In other words, what were they fasting for? His presence. Well, folks, what do we need today? We need God to pour out His Spirit in a greater manner, don't we? I'm not saying we don't have the Spirit and we're saved. I'm talking about the power of the Spirit to get the you know things going. But anyway, here from up here does this, and like the head of the house, He hands out the Father's goods, doesn't He? How long will He do this? Long until He comes again. Until it's time for Him to come again. And when He comes again, that'll be the end of it, won't it? Okay, does that make sense so far? All right, let's take a break there and we'll pick it back up.